Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Tivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. Once you enter into a laboratory, the first thing what you are going to do is you are going to prepare different types of solutions or reagents, whether it is a reagent for performing the SDS page or the agrose gyrolactophoresis or whether it is a reagent for doing some of the cell biology, immunology or the molecular biology experiments. All these reagent preparation requires a definite training as well as the precautions what you have to take. So in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about all these precautions, how to prepare the solutions and in addition, we are also going to discuss uh, how to prepare the buffers because most of these solutions are made up of, of buffers so that it does not change the pH of that particular solution while you are doing the reactions. So we will start the lectures with the uh, understanding how to prepare the different types of solutions, how you can, what are the precautions you should take while you are preparing the solutions and what are the different ways in which you can be able to prepare the solutions. So the, as the name suggests, the solution means a liquid mixture in which the minor component that is the solute or the powder is uniformly distributed within the major component that is the solvent or the liquid, which means a solution is uh, is a summation of the solute which is actually the powder plus the solvent which is actually the liquid part. So, solvent is going to be the major component, the solute is going to be the minor component. But when you prepare the solutions in a in a in a life sciences lab or in a chemistry lab, you can actually prepare the solution by two ways. Either you take a solute which is actually going to be in the form of powder and then you dissolve that into a solvent and that actually is going to give you a solution. In the other way, you can also have the liquid reagents like a uh, uh, like glycerol right for example and then you can add that to a solvent the, the so there are two ways in which you can be able to prepare the solutions either you take the powder and mix it with the solvent and that actually is going to give you a solution or you can be able to just mix the two different liquids and that also is going to give you the uh, solutions. Uh, so either of these way the, the solution can be prepared in different ways. Uh, so, you can prepare the solution in the molar terms. So, when you prepare a solution, you can use the different types of unit to prepare the solution. For example, you can prepare the molar solutions like, so the molarity of a solution depends on the number of moles of the solute per liter of the solutions. It, it, it can be, uh, it can be a millimolar that is the millimolar means 10 to power minus 3 molar, it can be a micromolar which means 10 to power minus 6 molar or a nanomolar solution which is actually going to be 10 to power minus 9 solutions. So let us see how to prepare a molar solution. So for example, if, you, if I ask you to prepare the 1 molar glucose 100 ml solutions, so the information what you require if you want to prepare a molar solution is that you require a molecular weight of the molecule. So in this case, the molecular weight of the glucose is 180 and the volume what you require, so volume is 100 ml. So to prepare the 100 ml 1 molar glucose, what you need to do is you need to weigh the 18 grams of glucose and transfer it to a 1 liter volumetric flask. Then you add the 700 to 800 ml of purified water and you allow that to swell to dissolve and then you can add the water so that the bottom of the meniscus is at the uh, at the line of the flask, then you can you, you can use the stopper and mix well. The flask must be labeled with the solution concentration that is the 0.1 molar uh, glucose which is 100 millimolar glucose and you date prepared and the name of the preparator. This means the molarity what you can prepare is simply with this formula that is W into 1000 divided by the molecular weight into the volume of that particular solution. So you have, if you put like one molar, for example, so in this case you put one here and uh, weight you have to calculate and the molecular weight is 180 whereas the volume is 100. So if I do that and if you do a math, the W is going to be 18 grams in this case. 
So, this is very easy to do because the molecular weight of a compound if it is dissolved in 1 liter it is actually going to give you a 1 molar solution. So, that you only have to remember if you require to prepare the 0.1 molar uh, uh, solution then you just divide the molecular weight by 1 tenth. If you divide to if you if you want to prepare the one molar solution but the volume is 100 ml then you just divide the, so, so so because when you prepare the solution in the lab you cannot do this kind of extensive uh, calculations and you know so that's why it is very easy to understand that the molecular weight of a compound dissolved in one liter of solution or the solvent is actually going to give you one molar solutions if you dissolve the milligrams of solution and dissolve it into the 1 ml of solution or 1 ml of solvent that actually is going to give you the millimolar uh, uh, concentrations. So, that is actually the way you have to calculate so that when you are actually preparing these solutions you should do very quickly because if I ask you 50 millimolar trace pH 8.0 then you should not take time because you, you know the calculation for 18 millimolar or suppose 100 millimolar NaCl. So, you know the NaCl molecular weight is 58.5. So, you just divide that number by 10. So, 5.8 grams is what required for 100 millimolar NaCl solution for 1 liter. So, that is the way you have to do it in your lab. So, initially when you are a new student in the lab, you might have to do calculation every time, but when you are slightly experienced and then you know that what is the trick. The trick is you should remember if I have to prepare a 1 molar solution. I have to just take the molecular weight, I have to just go with the molecular weight which is actually been given onto the label of that particular bottle and then I have to just divide according to the volume. Similarly, you can prepare the normal normality solution. So, normality is the number of equivalents of the solute per liter of the solutions. The, the way that you prepare the molar solution, the, the same way you have to prepare the equivalent solutions, uh, normality solutions. The only difference is that you have to take the equivalent molecular weights of the equivalents. Then you can also prepare the percentage by the weight which means the concentration based on the number of grams of the solute per 100 grams of solutions or the per 100 grams of solvent. So, weight percentage is very uh, very difficult to do because you know in the case of solvent how you are going to calculate the, uh, the weight actually. So, if you want to calculate the weight actually you have to take the formula of the water. For example, if I am using the water as the uh, for the weight then water's molecular weight is actually the 18 grams. So, if 18 grams of water is actually going to give you a, uh, the, so it's a, that's a way you have to calculate the molecular weight of your solvent and the molecular weight, uh, the, uh, the, the weight of your uh, compound is anyway going to be in, the, in powder anyway. Then percentage by the volume which means the weight percentage by volume. So, concentration based on the number of grams of solute per 100 ml of solution. Then you have the weight per volume which means the uh, percentage based on the number of grams of or milligrams or the micrograms of solute per unit volume. For example, the milligram per ml, gram per liter or milligram per 100 ml. Uh, when you are preparing a solutions, you might have to do two processes where you can have to do a dilution of the strong acid or the base. So, when you are preparing a, when you are diluting a strong acid or a strong base, for example, if I am this diluting like sulfuric acid which is actually a strong acid or if I am diluting the NaOH which is actually a strong base then why I have to take lot of precautions because when you are diluting a strong acid uh, you have to dilute the acid in such a way that you have to a take the acid and then you take the acid and drop uh, drop wise you have to add that acid into the solvent uh, solvent uh, system for example because, uh, because you you want to avoid the exothermic reaction when you are actually diluting a strong acid it actually is a exothermic reactions so because of that the solution is going to be very very hot so if i take a acid and if i start adding the water the exothermic reaction is going to be even bigger and that actually will sometime uh, can can actually damage the vessel where you have kept the acid Number two, it can sometime actually cause the injury because if the acid is very, uh, if it exothermic reaction occurs and uh, that actually going to break the glass vessel or flask, it actually can cause the um, uh, you know, acid burn or the injury. The same is true for the 
base also so base when you dilute you have to be very very careful because the base is also going to give you the exothermic reactions similarly you might have to dilute like a viscous thick solvent like for example the glycerol so if i have to take a glycerol and i want to dilute for example when when you are going to prepare the sample buffer for the electrophoresis the sample buffer actually contains the 40 percent glycerol which means you have to take the glycerol from the 100 ml from the 100 percent glycerol from the bottle and then you dilute it to 40 percent in that case the uh, taking out the viscous material like th uh, gly uh, glycerol is actually requires lot of precautions because because of the only reason that these are thick solutions so they will actually they are sucking through the pipette is going to be very very slow and they are also going to be dis, uh, deposit onto the outer surface of the tip for example if i am drawing the uh, the glycerol what happen is the glycerol is going to attach to the outer surface of this uh, pipe, uh, tip as well as the movement of glycerol is going to be very very small because the suction pressure is same whether it is the it is the water or it is the glycerol so in that case what we normally do or what is recommended is that you cut the tip uh, the top surface of the kit tip and because of that the 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 lower end of the tip is going to have the bigger diameter and then the sucking is going to be fa uh, faster you don't have to worry that i have I have, uh, you know, I have, I have removed the, some part of the tip. The, the, uh, the accuracy of the volume what I am withdrawing is also going to be different. That is not going to be different because what the volume what you are going to withdraw is actually be proportional to the amount of vacuum what you have created in the pipettes, not to the tip uh, shape or the size of the tip actually. So if I uh, cut it, actually, I am going to suck the glycerol into the uh, much quicker. And on top of that, because you are going to have large amount of glycerol on top of this tip, you also have to wipe this tip or across the, you know, the bottle. Because if that you do, that you are going to remove all the excess glycerol what is present in. And then when you are dispensing this liquid into the next solvent, then also you have to be very careful because you have to keep pressing the, uh, the pipette and you have to remain in that situation for very, very long time so that the last drop of the glycerol is also going to be removed from your pipette tip. Because as I said, you know, the sucking of the thick liquid is also going to be a problem that the dispensing of that particular liquid is also going to be having the same trouble because it will take more amount of time for this liquid to come out from the pipette tip and so that is why it is recommended that you have to be very very careful when you are uh, handling the viscous thick liquids. So now once you have prepared the solutions, the solutions are uh, actually being made in such a way that the solutions are actually going to have one component which actually going to resist for the change in pH because in most of the buffer most of the solutions you are actually going to add the buffer components so that when you are doing the reactions it should not change the pH of that particular solution because you want to keep the pH of that particular solution to be remain intact at, as the same. For example, if I am running the SDS page and if I am using the 1.5 molar trisp which 8.8, .8, I want to ensure that the pH of this particular solution remain 8.8. .8. It should not go like 6.8 or 9.5 because if that happens, then the resolution of that particular gel is going to be affected. The, solu the way the solutions are, the, the way the molecules are going to be resolved onto the SDS page also may get affected affected if there will be a change in pH and uh, so that is why the change in pH is very very crucial for performing the reactions when you are as far as the, you are talking about the biological reactions or the in the, in the case of biochemistry. Uh, so what is the what is mean by the pH is that pH is actually a scale which actually measures the concentration of the hydrogen ion uh, concentration within the solutions. So you can understand that when a water is present, it actually get ionized in the form of H plus and OH minus. So it also, so if you take the two water molecules, it actually going to give you a hydronium ion as well as the OH minus. So if I ask or uh, write the equilibrium constant of this particular reactions, what I will do is, I will write the equilibrium constant of H plus OH minus and the H2O. 
so the concentration of the pure water so if i put the values of all these things so concentration of the pure water is 55.5 molar and the k equilibrium for a, this reaction is actually 1.8 into 10 to the power minus 16 so if i put these values what will happen is that if you calculate the H plus into the OH minus is going to be 1.8 into 10 to the power minus 16 divided by the 55.5. So, if you solve all these and put the value of uh, this that you are going to get the KW. So, so the, multipl see the multiplication of H plus and OH minus is actually going to give you a value which is called as KW and the KW is actually uh, called uh, is uh, the value of the K, KW is 10 to power minus 14 m square. So, KW is the ion product of the water at 25 degree Celsius which means the product of the H plus and OH minus. This means in the pure water the H plus is going to be uh, the underscore of KW and that is going to be uh, uh, underscore of 10 to power minus 14. So, if you solve that the H plus is going to be equivalent to the OH minus and that actually is going to give you a value of 10 to power minus 7 m. So, ion product of a water is a constant and that allow us to calculate the H plus in case the OH minus is known or vice versa. So, this means the H plus the product of H plus and OH minus is actually going to be 10 to power minus 14. So, if I have H plus I can calculate the OH minus, if I have the OH minus I can calculate the H plus. For example, if I have a solution of 10 to power minus 3 and it is HCl actually, so then what will happen? Let us see, right? So, if I have to calculate the OH minus, OH minus is going to be 10 to power minus 11 because you can just divide this and it, that actually going to give you the OH minus. So, hence it is used to develop a pH scale to define the concentration of H plus or OH minus in any aqueous solution. This means if I if I know the H plus I can calculate the OH minus and that is why this uh, ion product is giving you a scale where on one side you are going to have the acidic range, on other side you are going to have the basic range and in the center you are going to have the neutral center. So, that is why so, it is developed a pH scale where actually you are going to have the minus 7 on one side and plus 7 on the other side and the pH is defined as the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So, it is ranges from 1 to 40. So, this is what you have to see that the pH scale where you have a 0 scale which is actually the pH 0 7 and on this side you are going to have the acidic range, on this side you are going to have the basic range which means on this side you are going to have more and more acid and this side you are going to have more and more basics. For example, I have given you an example of different types of products what we use in a daily life. For example, you have the SCL solution which is actually going to have a pH of 1, then you have uh, the lime which is actually or lemon which is actually going to have a pH 2. Then you have the apples which are actually going to have the pH 3, then you have tomato which is apple uh, pH of 4, then banana, then potato and then you have the water which is actually of the pH 7 which is actually the neutral pH. Similarly, on the basic side also you have lot of solutions like you have the detergent powders and you have the acids and you have the NA solution which is actually going to give you a pH of 14. So, these are so, pH is a very very important scale to measure the acidity or the uh, alkalinity of a particular solution. So, if the pH is less than 7, it is actually going to be acidic. If pH is more than 7, then pH then the, it is going to be a alkaline solution. Now, the question comes why you actually have required a buffer and what is mean by the buffer. So, buffer solutions are used as a mean of keeping pH at a nearly constant value in a wide range of chemical applications. In nature, there are many systems that use the buffering for pH regulations. One of the classical example is the biocarbonate buffering system. So, biocarbonate buffering system actually utilizes the three components the carbonic acid H2CO3, bicarbonate ions HCO3 minus and then the carbon dioxide which is actually being present into the air. So, 
by using these uh, three mo molecules under the equilibrium the bicarbonate buffer is actually maintaining the ph of the blood to support the proper metabolic reactions and you have many conditions or many situations where the slight change in the pH of the blood for example the blood of the pH of the blood is ranging from 7.35 to 7.4 so if you have slight change in the pH for example if you have a pH of 7.2 uh, you are going to have the acidosis problems like where the person is going to have the lot of problem in the breathing difficulties and all those kind of thing because what you remember is if it goes into the acidic range indirectly you are actually going to affect the carbon assimilations or carbon transport within the system which means you are indirectly going to affect the oxygen transport as well so if it is actually more and more carbon dioxide is going to be associated with the body it is actually going to uh, reduce the amount of oxygen within the body as well so that's actually is uh, because the carbon dioxide is under the equilibrium within this particular buffering system and that's how the carbon dioxide is being transported from one part of the body to another part of the body and eventually it reaches to the lung where the carbon dioxide is being removed from the body and the oxygen is being transported back but if you actually going to change the ph of the uh, the blood and that actually is if allows the accumulation of carbon dioxide within the blood then it is actually going to change the overall uh, respiratory activities and other kind of activities because the whole body depends on the respiration to perform the all the functions for example if you even if it a liver which does not been directly attached with the lungs and other places but it requires the oxygen to perform the functions so if there will be any change in blood of the ph that eventually going to accumulate the carbon dioxide into the liver or it actually not going to provide the enough oxygen for the liver to respire to produce the energy and to perform all the metabolic reactions so that's how it, the maintaining a crucial ph is very important for the normal physiology of a human being as well as for the other animals apart from the physiology let's see how the ph is also changing the other biological processes for example the enzymes are proteinaceous in nature and they are made up of, of individual amino acid with the ionizable side chains such as the histidine in addition the active site of enzyme also has the active uh, amino acids a particular agent is important for substrate binding formation of catalytic intermediates and the release of product for example the pepsin is a serine protease present in stomach and has the optimum ph of 1.5 whereas the trypsin has a ph optima of 7.4 so that's why most of the enzymes are actually having the ionizable groups they have the active site residues and all these active site residues are have to be present in a particular uh, you know valency state and as well as the ionization states so because of that the a particular ph of that particular milieu or the pl place where these enzymes are present it has to be in a perfect order so that it should uh, these enzymes are actually going to work very efficiently one of the classical example is the pepsin which is actually present in the stomach and it requires a ph of 1.5 to digest the food similarly whereas the trypsin which is another protease require a ph of 7.4 to function similarly you in many pathological conditions such as diabetes body utilizing uh, uh, stored food as an alternative energy process the similar condition exists in the case of starvation or fasting and under these condition a large amount of acid like the beta hydroxy butyric acid from fat is generated leading to the lowering of blood ph to cause the acidosis it disturbs the activity of several enzyme present in the blood and ultimately leads to the headache nausea and the convulsions so as i think we already discussed about the role of the blood ph so here are the few examples like if a person is suffering from the diabetes and instead of using the glucose if it starts using the fat and other kind of uh, stored food material then eventually it is actually going to produce lot of uh, acidic bio by products like metabolic by products and that actually is going to lower down the ph of the blood and that condition is called as the acidosis and acidosis is directly going to affect the first organ that is the brain actually so if the acidosis is there it actually going to affect 
the brain because the brain is going to deprive of oxygen and the ultimately it is going to cause initially the with the with the minor mild symptoms it is going to cause the development of headache but if the the conditions continued and there will be no uh, change in the pH of that particular blood so that there will be no supply of oxygen then the headache is going to be turned into the nausea and convulsions. Similarly, the pH, blood pH is maintained by the bicarbonate buffer and it plays vital role in respirations. So that means the buffer is very important for the enzymatic activity as well as the normal physiology of the uh, for the body. Here are few examples where I have given you a table of showing that what is the pH optima of different enzyme. For example, even if you have a same enzyme, you see the same enzyme is present in three different locations like the lipase which is present in pancreas having a pH optima of 8 whereas if the lipase is present in stomach has a uh, pH optima of 4 to 5 and if the lipase is present in the castor oil that is the plant the, the pH optima is 4.7 then the pepsin which is the pH optima of 1.5 the trypsin pH optima of 7.8 urease 7 invertase maltase amylase and catalase and in general what you see is if you plot the pH, act, uh, pH based uh, activity of an enzyme what you will see is it is actually having a biphasic behavior which means at this site you are actually having the optimum pH. This is the place where the enzyme is going to work optimally on the both the side whether you are go on to the acidic side or whether you go on to the basic side you are actually going to affect the activity of these enzymes. Why you are going to change the activity of enzyme because you are actually changing the ionization states of those amino acids which are either present uh, uh, into the crucial points where either they are uh, crucial for stabilizing the structures or they are important for catalyzing the reactions. So either of these situations the change in pH is actually going to affect the ionization stage of the side chains and eventually it is going to disrupt some of the uh, you know the uh, electrostatic interactions or van der Waal interactions or the salt bridge interactions with the neighboring residues. For example, if you have a lysine and it is making an interaction with the glutamate and if you change the pH either of these pairs are actually not going to be in a proper ionization state and that is how the that particular interaction is going to be broken down and once these interactions are going to be broken down it eventually leads to either the uh, the particular that particular portion of the enzyme is going to be moved or there will be a conformational changes in the enzyme and that eventually is going to make the enzyme less efficient compared to that when it was present in the optimal pH conditions. So that is why the pH is very important and that is why the buffer is also very important that uh, why it be to maintain a pH. Now the question comes how the buffer is actually maintaining the pH. So the buffer is actually a mixture of weak acid and a conjugate base or the vice versa. So you can imagine that you have a condition like HA plus B and that actually is ionizing to give you A minus NHB. So in this ionization reactions, the HA and A minus are actually being part of the one conjugate acid base pair whereas the B minus and the HB are actually making the another conjugate acid base pair which means the HA and B is making one pair and the B minus and HB is making a another pair. This means the HA can uh, that is why the HA is a weak acid which is being associated with a strong base and that actually is going to give you the uh, buffer. So HA is going to be uh, ionized like HA H plus and A minus. So that is the ionization of the HA which is a weak acid uh, and with a strong base. So if you add the strong acid like if you add the H plus so what will happen is the HA plus H plus so there should be an increase in H plus because you are increasing the H plus but what happen is the H plus whatever you are adding is actually combining with A minus and that is how you are actually getting the more amount of HA instead of getting the more amount of A plus H plus which means the H plus remain constant and that is the resultant of the change in pH because when you when you calculate what is the pH of this solution you are actually going to consider only 
the H plus or ionizable H plus present in this particular solution. So, even if you have added the acid which is a strong acid and that actually is going to combine with the strong base and that is how it is actually going to be get neutralized. Now, imagine that if I have added the strong base OH minus then what will happen? The OH minus is going to be added to the HA which is actually a buffer. Then what will happen? OH minus should have increased uh, should have the increased the uh, uh, pH, but what happen is the OH minus is going to combine with H plus and it is actually going to form the water and the A minus will remain the same which means the base component will remain the A minus which is actually been responsible for that particular pH of that particular solution. Since you are adding the base you expect that the A minus should go up because that is the base component of that particular solution, but instead of that it actually been neutralized by the uh, acid component and that how it is actually going to be uh, you know remain the same pH that is how. So, that is so in a in a buffer you have a combination of the acid as well as the base. So, if you add the acid the base is going to react and neutralize the acid. If you add the base the acid is going to react and neutralize the base and that is how it is actually going to maintain the pH of that particular solution, but how long that uh, buffer is going to maintain the pH. So, that is in always being measured with a definition called as the buffering capacity or the buffer capacity. So, buffer capacity is a quantitative measure of a resistance to the change of pH of a solution containing a buffering agent with respect to a change of acid or the alkaline concentration. Because you can imagine that even we are adding the H plus and that H plus is acting neutralized by A minus that is actually going to be equal or uh, proportional to the amount of A plus or A minus what you have in the solution. So, once the A minus are going to be exhausted which means keep adding the acid eventually what will happen is that the A minus is going to be exhausted which means there is no longer the A minus is going to be available to take care of the H plus what you are adding from the acid. And in that situation if you add another drop of H plus that H plus is not going to be neutralized and at that actually is going to lower down the pH of that particular solution. So, that is how the buffer is going to maintain the pH until you have some form of ionizable basis or some form of ionizable acid present in that particular solution and that is actually decides the buffering capacity of that particular P, uh, buffer solutions. And that can be measured simply by quantitatively if you titrate a uh, buffer solutions with the acid and the base and that actually is going to give you that value of what is the buffering capacity of that particular solution. And is it advisable that you should work with the buffer within its buffering capacity which means you cannot work beyond that buffering capacity because if you work beyond the buffering capacity then as soon as you are actually going to have any change in the H plus or OH minus concentration or if there will be any generation of H plus or OH minus within the solution it is actually going to change the pH of the solution because you are working beyond the buffering capacity of that particular buffer. Now, let us see how you can be able to do a titration. So, if you titrate a weak acid for example, in this case I have taken an example of acetic acid and with a strong base like the NaOH. So, addition of a NaOH neutralizes the H plus ion present in the solution thereby increasing its pH. Consumption of H plus ions drive the dissociation of the uh, acetic acid into the CH3 minus NH plus as more and more of NaOH is added the pH of the solution will increases which means in the beginning you are not adding any OH this means pH of the solution is 1 actually and as you are actually increasing the OH minus you are actually taking up the pH of this but the you are increasing the pH and what you will see is that it is actually keep increasing as long as you are adding the OH equivalents ok. But at this point Okay, you will see that the, the change of the pH is going to be very very small. Uh, so, 
This increase in pH is small when the solution reaches the pH close to the pK of acetic acid. So, the pK of acetic acid is 4.6. So, and we will understand what is the pK. So, a weak acid therefore provides a resistance to change in pH near its pK values. This resistance to the change in pH by an acid near its pK is the concept of the buffer, which means if you reach to the pK of that particular weak acid, you will see that it is taking longer time to change its pH and that is how if you titrate that, you will be able to know in what buffering range the change in pH or the slope of that particular. So, if you see the slope of this curve, the slope of the curve is very sharp here, the slope of the curve is very sharp here, but the slope of curve is very flattened in this particular region, which means in this particular region, the buffer is actually uh, or the weak acid is actually resisting for the change in pH and that is how you can be able to calculate the buffering range of that particular weak acid. So, the buffering range for example, in this case the pK is 4.6, the buffering range is starting from the 5.76 to 3.76 which means as a thumb rule, if whatever the pK is there, uh, you are actually going to see the buffering range plus minus 1 which means if your pK is 4.76, the buffering range will start from 3.76 to 5.76 which is actually in this case. Now, we will understand what is pK. So, understanding the pK will understand about the henderson Hasselbach equations. So, the dissociation of a weak acid in water can be written as the HA plus water equal to hydronium ion plus A minus. The ionization can be represented by the equilibrium constant K equilibrium that is the hydronium ion A minus water and HA. Okay? And if you solve all these equations and if you put the values of the H2 water concentration of water, concentration of hydronium ion and all other concentrations, what will happen is the eventually you are going to get an equation called as the P, uh, pH equal to pK plus log concentration of A minus divided by AH and this equation is called as the henderson Hasselbach equations and according to this equations, the pK can be defined as the pH at which the acid is 50 percent ionized, which means if A minus is equivalent to A plus AH, the pK is going to be equivalent to the pH. So, the pH at which the, the acid is going to be 50 percent hydrolyzed, that is the pH what is called as the pK and pK is a very uh, important information because it tell you that at this particular point, the buffer is going to resist for change in pH and the pK is also going to allow you to calculate the buffering capacity. Now, let us understand how to prepare the buffer. So, I have taken an example of how to prepare the buffer at pH 7.4. The first thing what you have to need is because you want to prepare a buffer at pH 7.4 which means you are looking for a pK of 6.4 to 8.4 which means you are looking for some solutions which should have a pK of 6.4 or 8.4 because you can easily go one unit down or you can go up you one unit up. So, the selection is based on the pK of the acid and acid can be used to prepare a buffer with a pK range of pK plus minus 1 which means I am looking for a acid which has a pK range of 6.4 to 8.4. This means that you cannot prepare an acetate buffer of pH 7.4 because the pK is 4.6 actually because the acidic acetate conjugate passage is a good buffer in a pH range of 3.76 to 5.76. Let us see the dissociation constant of phosphoric acid. So, in the case of phosphoric acid, which is actually the called as H3PO4, is being uh, uh, dissociate in three different forms. So, H3PO4 is being dissociate first in the form of H2PO4. So, one hydrogen is being dissociated. So, you have one H plus here, right? And then you have H2PO4 which has been uh, ionized to form the HPO4 minus plus H plus 1, right? And then the HPO4 is being hydrolyzed as PO3 minus plus H plus. So, this means the uh, 
the phosphoric acid which is H3PO4 is being ionized in three different forms and that is how you are actually going to have the equilibrium constant of these reactions, the three equilibrium constant and the pK of this H3PO4 is also going to be 3. So, pK1 which is for this reaction is going to be 2.12. So, that is not useful because you are uh, you know this is very far away from 7.4. The pK2 is 7.21 which is for this reaction and pK3 is 12.25, 12.35. So, that is also not correct. So, this pK of 7.21 can be used which means you can be able to use the phosphoric acid to prepare the buffer of 7.4. Now, to prepare the buffer, you what you have to do is the phosphate buffer of any pH can be prepared starting with any of the four chemicals. Suppose we have the following four chemicals in the laboratory like phosphoric acid, NH2PO4, Na2HPO4 and Na3PO4 which means all these are actually the derivatives of the phosphoric acid. So, this is the phosphoric acid, this is the sodium phosphate, this is the sodium dihydrogen phosphate and this is the sodium phosphate. So, uh, and the molecular weight is given. So, you have the two method in which you can be able to prepare the buffer. What you can do is you can take the required amount of phosphoric acid or NH2PO4, you dissolve it in a 400 ml water, the pH of this solution will be less than 7.4, then you can titrate this with the help of the NaOH and uh, eventually you bring the uh, pH to 7.4 and that is how you can be able to prepare the buffer. The second method is that you take a mixture of NaH2PO4, Na2HPO4 and you bring the pH to 7.4 with the help of the uh, solving the percentage of the both the components uh, using the henderson hasenbeck equations. So, let us see how to prepare with method 1 and method 2 also. For the method 1 what you have to do is first you have to prepare the NaOH because that is what you are going to use to raise the uh, pH of that particular solution. Then you take the 400 ml of distilled water in a conical flask, you add the 11.53 ml of the H3PO4 drop wise in a 400 ml distilled water. Uh, you calibrate the pH meter or pH probe that we have already discussed in a previous uh, lecture. Then you add the one normal NaOH drop wise, shake well and measure the pH and you keep measuring the pH until it reaches to 7.4 and once it reaches to the 7.4, then you can transfer the content of the flask in a 500 molecular flask, you add water to make the final volume of 500 ml and the required buffer is ready. In the buff method 2, uh, the method 2 you have to use the henderson hasenbeck equations. So, the pH is equal to pK plus log A minus minus AH. If you put all these values, so pH is 7.4, the pK is 7.21, the log A, uh, A minus versus AH. So, you calculate then it actually is going to give you the proportion of the HPO4 minus 2 minus versus the H2PO4 minus and that is 1.54 which means you have to take the Na2HPO4 and the NaH2PO4 in a ratio of 1 is to 1.5488. So, if you calculate all these what will happen is the uh, the amount of NaH2PO4 required would be the 47.03 grams and the amount of Na2HPO4 required would be the uh, if you can you can just put the value into this equations it actually going to give you the amount for the uh, for the Na2HPO4 as well. Then what you have to do is you weigh the 47.03 grams of NaH2PO4 and if you calculate you will get a value of 162.99 grams of Na2HPO4 and that anyway you can calculate. Uh, the transfer the salt into 1 liter conic flask and add the 400 ml of distilled water and then you shake the well to achieve the complete solution dissolution of the salt. Then you you know prepare the electrode for measuring the pH. You place the pH electrode into the phosphate solution and measure its pH. Although the amount of the conjugate acid and bases are weighed so as to achieve a pH of 7.4 because as per the henderson hasenbeck equations, the pH should be 7.4 if you are adding these two components in a proportion what is being 
uh, calculated from the equation, but it is not been always been uh, achieved because there could be some variation and that is how the pH is uh, roughly you will find the 7.4. So, if the pH of the solution is more than 7.4 or less than 7.4, then you add the one normal NaOH and you can adjust the pH to 7.4. If the pH of the solution is more than 7.4, then you add the phosphoric acid drop wise and shake the flask and measure the pH keep doing this until the 7.4 is achieved. So, if you have the less than 7.4 you add the NaOH and you adjust the pH to 7.4. If you have more than 7.4 because in, in case some component are more and less then you can actually add the phosphoric acid to bring the pH down to 7.4. So, now what we have done, we have measured, we have discussed about the preparing the buffer with method 1 or method 2 and uh, I am sure you might have uh, realized that the method 1 is much easier compared to the method 2 because uh, method 1 requires just the phosphoric acid, you add the phosphoric acid, you adjust the pH with NaOH or in the method 2 you might have to do lot of calculations and then you have to bring uh, you know determine the ratios of the two components and then you have to adjust the pH at the end. So, uh, you know but the problem is that if you do uh, method 1 or the method 2 irrespective of any of these method eventually uh, you are actually going to change the strength of the buffer which cause if you remember in the beginning itself we said that we have to prepare a buffer which is 200 millimolar phosphate buffer pH 7.4 because if you do all these addition of phosphoric acid and addition of NaOH and all that it is actually going to change the uh, buffer strength of that particular solution. So, if you have to very strictly calculate or want to make the 200 millimolar phosphate buffer pH 7.4, then you cannot use either of these methods because the both of these methods are actually going to give you the different uh, concentration of the phosphate at the end because you have to use either NaOH or the phosphoric acid to adjust the pH. Then you can actually follow the third method and the third method what you have to do is we know that the Na2HPO4 and the NaH2PO4 are required in a ratio of 1.54 versus 1. So, what we can do is we can prepare the 200 millimolar solution of both the NH2HPO4 and NH2PO4 in a 1.5 and, and then you mix them in a ratio of 1.54 versus 1. 1. Uh, so, as we need to prepare the 500 ml buffer, we would pr perform the calculations for a slightly higher volume for example, 550 ml. So, 1 by 1.54 plus 1 into 500, so 196.17 ml of NaH2PO4 and 1.54 divided by this and if you calculate it is actually going to give you 303.83 ml of Na2HPO4. So, what you do is you take the 196 ml of this, 303 ml of this and then you mix them and that actually is going to give you the 500 ml of 200 millimolar phosphate buffer. Now, you measure the pH, it is possible that the pH of this solution may not be uh, 7.4. But in that case what you have to do is if the pH of the solution is less than 7.4 then what you can do is you can titrate this with 200 millimolar Na2HPO4 until the pH reaches to 7.4. If the pH is more than 7.4 then in that case what you do is you titrate with 200 millimolar NaH2PO4 until the pH reaches to 7.4. So, irrespective of the buffer or irrespective of P final pH whether it is ab above 7.4 or lower to 7.4, the final buffer strength is going to be remain as 200 millimolar because the, the solution what you are adding for titration is 200 with a 200 millimolar strength. Earlier we were adding the concentrated NaOH or to the concentrated phosphoric acid and that is actually is going to change the molarity of that particular final buffer. Whereas, in this case you are actually adding the 200 millimolar uh, uh, 200 millimolar strength of the solutions to adjust the pH and that is how actually you are going to get the final buffer which is actually going to be 200 millimolar phosphate buffer. 
So this is the different buffer solution what I have given you. I have given you the recipe as well. So this is just for your information that you have multiple types of buffers and the recipes or the, uh, the multiple component what you have to dissolve and prepare the buffer and then what is their applications in uh, performing different types of reactions or different types of assays. And so with this uh, I would like to conclude my lecture here and in this lecture we have discussed about how to prepare the solutions, how to prepare the buffers, what is the significance of the buffer in the bio biochemical reaction as well as in your experiments as well. So with this I would like to conclude my lecture here, thank you.